I think there are many challenges, and as a urban climatologist, urban uh, environmentalist, uh, um, I, I think the, for developing country, the challenge is to provide a clean, uh, comfortable and healthy city for activities to continue. Again, that has been a challenge for most uh, developing countries and developing cities. Uh, but for developed cities and, and countries, the challenge is slightly different, and that is to provide uh, quote and unquote enjoyment for people to continue their work. And so the, 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 the challenges are for different kind of situations are slightly different. So I think uh, it is important to look at these things uh, differently and, and try to tackle them. And they require different kind of tools and mindset and strategies and policies. So these are the things that I think in view of uh, the aging societies and also the climate change and also other uncertainties, these are the challenges that which will face us uh, increasingly more and more for different kinds of cities. My PhD was on solar radiation and that is how the sun uh, drives the earth. And urban climatology is uh, basically a continuation of that piece of studies uh, 20 years ago. So I've been working on this kind of things uh, as a scientist for almost 20 years, uh, studying the interaction between the heat energy of the atmosphere and the earth, the moisture content between the air and the soil, uh, the, uh, how buildings block the air and allow air to move through because of the city construction and morphology. And most important is to understand how people feel and how they aspire, how they need, how they suffer sometimes in the cities that we have built for them. So over the last 20 years, uh, the work has been mostly scientific. But uh, in the last 10 years, uh, I think since SARS in, in 2003 in Hong Kong, there is an increasing uh, call for this kind of scientific understanding to be translated into policies and guidelines. And that is how I started uh, my work just over 10, year, 10 years ago uh, for the Hong Kong government on how to translate this kind of understanding into, into, into practice guidelines. And that has not been easy because we scientists don't like uh, the political way of talking. And the politicians have no patience on us. Uh, they don't understand equation and we don't understand policy. So the challenge in the last uh, 10 years or so has been to find ways to bridge the uh, communication gap. Uh, we need to find a way to understand each other, to develop vocabularies, and most important of all, to develop common information platform and tools for dialogue to be exchanged. And this is how we started uh, drafting uh, climatic map for Hong Kong, because maps are tools that uh, planners use. So they understand maps better than they understand equations. So we have to find ways to knowledge transfer this kind of uh, scientific understanding into map form so that planners and policy makers have a way to understand them. And the map has to be constructed in such a way that uh, they don't have too much uh, or redundant information that the planner doesn't need. And the policy maker has to understand it in a matter of 30 seconds, things like that. And they have to understand the implication and the value of the maps so that when they implement their policy, they know what they are doing. So towards a kind of evidence-based way of looking at things, uh, we, together with the planners and the industry stakeholders, uh, try to formulate this kind of map uh, together so that uh, nowadays they become standard and guidelines and practice notes. So recently, in the last, I would say, four or five years, the uh, government of Hong Kong has been uh, promoting and, and issuing uh, different kind of guidelines to help the uh, industry to transform their mindset and thinking and the way of doing things. Some of them are not very welcoming, uh, especially our developers are a little bit uh, more powerful than everybody else. And they believe that this is a cartel of their freedom to design or we are not using the resources properly. 
but always tell the government that you have to find ways to balance uh, on the one hand development and on the other hand sustainability and the enjoyment of people living in cities. So the map provides a tool that these two may be balanced. Uh, this is a very uh, poorly understood concept in, in the whole arena of, of this kind of urban uh, environmental understanding. Uh, it means that uh, in order to tackle the situation holistically, you have to, first of all, chop them down into different scales. Uh, at the global scale, the, it has to be the effort of intergovernmental kind of collaboration. So you cannot close your door and say, this is Singapore or this is China and solve your own problem. You cannot do that. You have to talk to your surrounding country. You have to talk to countries that are very far away. So intergovernmental kind of uh, uh, collaboration is needed for the global scale understanding. Uh, as you come down to the regional and the city scale, the, of course the government can do a lot of things at the policy level, okay, strategic level. Then uh, as you come down to the uh, uh, neighborhood scale or district scale, then the agency is like URA or HDB and they can do a lot of things. Then it comes down to the street scale or estate scale, then the, develop, uh, the developer, the uh, designer, the planners will need to do something. Uh, but most important of all is the human scale. The, because we are designing cities for people and they have to value uh, engineer their behavior, their adaptations, and their expectation and also their way of prioritizing the way that they want to live. Now, you have to somehow uh, chop the whole uh, problem into a different scale to start with because different scales require different tools, different understanding, different stakeholders and different interaction. But uh, most of the time, we stop at that level. And uh, my take-home message, should I call it this way, is that you have to talk not only amongst the uh, different stakeholders within your scale. You have to talk uh, with stakeholders beyond the scale. Okay? So we all have our own role and therefore responsibility of the city at our own scale. And we have to humble ourselves, lower our ego, and to learn these language and the vocabulary and the thinking mechanism of another scale and appreciate them and vice versa. Only when the scales are talking to each other, then the whole things can be uh, laid out more holistically. Otherwise, it will be piece and bits and pieces. So my, my, my message is that try to humble yourself and learn other people's language, uh, working method and respect them and, and communicate more. Uh, talk more to people that you don't understand. Uh, that, that, will, that will be the starting point. And, and events like this uh, will allow that to happen. And I hope that more of these kind of events can, can take place. First of all, the map has two components. One is the more scientific components of uh, collating all the uh, uh, urban data, land data, atmospheric data, weather data, climate data, and things like that into one system and formulate it in such a way that people can feel the, the system, i.e. we use the human metabolic rate and also biometeorology uh, understanding of, of, uh, of these uh, parameters to develop an index, to develop an indicator, to indicate if we do A, then people will feel B, okay? So we find this kind of causal relationship between the two. Then the second part of the map is to translate this scientific understanding into policy statements. For example, if the area it has a lack of air, for example, uh, and the, science, uh, take, the scientific uh, understanding tell you this, then you have to translate into a policy uh, statement like this area need to be uh, create uh, need to be developed into a breezeway kind of area with uh, enhanced greenery or that area is still okay and if you develop it further in this kind of way uh, then it will still be okay. So these are the planning language that the policymaker and planner can understand. So you translate the scientific understanding into a practical understanding. So this is the second part of the map. So the planner only need to look at the second part of the map. It, they don't need to look at the first part of the map. And the second part of the map, as the de city developed, we can update it very easily based on the science of the first part of the map. 
So in that way, the, uh, the communication kind of uh, bridging uh, is, uh, is, uh, is done, okay, is possible. Uh, so when we talk to uh, planners, for example, when they are reviewing their, in Hong Kong, for example, the outline zoning plan, which is a statutory plan for the, for the land, uh, they refer to the, um, the climatic map as, as, as a reference. So they know which area are sensitive, and which area they can develop, which area need a little bit more of uh, mitigation measures, things like that. So they can then develop their uh, plan for the next five or ten years uh, to improve the area based on the, uh, the needs and the aspiration of the people who are living there. So this is fundamentally the system of the map. And we have been doing that for Hong Kong and, and nowadays in surrounding uh, cities like Macau and many cities in China. And, uh, and I think uh, for smaller and, and also uh, more progressive cities, they need this kind of thing so, so that they don't make this, should I call it, the same mistake that Hong Kong has made in the last 10 years. Uh, we concentrate too much on development and neglecting the need for the enjoyment of people. So these two must be balanced. Yes, yes. I think the, the, the map technology, we did not invent it. Uh, I think the German uh, uh, researchers invented it about 30 years ago. And they have been applied to, uh, to, to the planning of uh, a number of German cities and in Europe as well. And uh, in Asia, uh, Japan actually was the first country uh, adopting this technology for Tokyo. And they therefore have their own uh, policy uh, implementation. Uh, in Hong Kong, we started late uh, in 2006, and it has been six or seven years. And uh, so far the map is done, and, but we are going to do more so that uh, we can cope with the uh, uh, two things. One is the climate change. The other one is a changing aspiration of people. So because uh, the aspiration of people 10 years ago is very different from uh, the aspirations of my sons. So we have to constantly update the whole thing. And, and in China, because of their very fast uh, 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 urbanization process, uh, in a way, they, they're a little bit impatient and they, they need the map tomorrow. That's the, and sometimes it's very difficult to do that because uh, in cities uh, that without a very good uh, information system, it is very difficult to do the, the map. So when working with Chinese cities, uh, we sometimes have to start from, from the ground and then build our information up before we can reach the level of analyze. I've been to a number of uh, uh, events, uh, congress and conferences like this, where uh, Chinese mayor and, and the construction uh, uh, ministry uh, uh, delegates uh, were there, and they understand how the map works, and we uh, contacted based on those kind of uh, presentation. And, and events like this, for example, will give me a chance to talk about the work and so that some mayor may be interested to know more about it. And once they contact me, then we can talk further the details and the logistics and the technicalities. Yes. I think Singapore uh, started this um, map effort uh, similarly. I think we, we gave a talk and then uh, URA people are very interested and, and they're very fast.